So welcome to uh, Earl's virtual music room. Nice you know. to be here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's been great uh, recording a bit and getting to know you. Uh, mm. So yeah, it's a simple question, but uh, I think it's a question we can ask the rest of our life. So why, why music? Why music? Um, that's a difficult question, but also in a way kind of simple. <laughs> Because um, music, I mean, I can remember from when I was very, very young, you know, even before I started playing when I was around five or six, um, I would be listening to music all the time. And um, then when I finally was playing, I would, I mean, when I was finally had a piano, I would get on and play and just improvise things. Um, and music was always just sort of part of me you know, in a way. I just, I guess I just had just a natural inclination towards it. And it's just always something that I did. Um, so I can't really think of how, like, it's simple in that this is, that's just what I do. <laughs> <laughs> how, who, uh, like where'd the music come from when, when, when you were that young, uh, you know? Well, I had my, I'm half Italian and my grandma, um, was you know very close to the family to my mom and she would um, put on you know old recordings of opera singers and um, I would just be listening to that and then my mom got me you know some recordings and I would put it on the you know CD player <laughs> next to my bed and I would have that on and I would just go to sleep listening to it and I remember when I was you know five, six, seven, I would just, every night before bed, I would take out the CD and read it, you know, read the booklet and be reading the text of the <laughs> <laughs> opera. And a few times my dad had to come in and, you know, to say it's time to go to bed because <laughs> it would keep me awake. But once I started listening, I would go to sleep, you know. Do you remember what, uh, what some of the content was, you know? Yes. Um, well, the first, I think the very first one was Aida, Verdi, Aida, and the recording was with Franco Corelli and Birgit Nielsen and Grace Bunbury. Mm -hmm. I still remember that. And then um, there was a set of operas like in one box with um, The Marriage of Figaro, Carmen, um, and then the one that I also was obsessed with was La Forza del Destino. With Force of Destiny. Yes, and that was with Tavaldi and Mario Del Monaco. So I was listening to that <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and what, uh, did you like the arias? Did you like the orchestral part? You know, did you like all of it? It's funny because courses? I had no idea, like, I had no idea what they were saying, but I would read, you know, the translation. And I, I did I understand the, te the meaning of the text? No, of course, <laughs> not all of it. Um, but there was just something about the music itself and the, the voice, you know, that really, I just was listening to it. I just loved it. Um, even though, um, you know, it didn't, it wasn't like I was, you know, understanding, you know, what I was reading or what, you know, some of it, yes, but some of it, it was more just the sound of the voice and the expression and the music itself. I know, uh, Right, a, a lot of opera. So I, I only speak English. Uh, you know, I've been to the Lincoln Center, and they have the little translation, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, which comes in handy. But most of the time, the music tells you what they're saying. You know, I yeah, mean, the, in the many feel cases, tells you it in, yeah, in a lot of ways. In, yeah, in many many cases, it's true. That Lincoln Center standing room in the back is like <laughs> the best deal in New York City. Like, I don't know, it's amazing. Yeah, the standing room. I've never actually been in the standing room. Oh, really? No. But, um, I mean, I, I pass it when I go to the seats. <laughs> <laughs> the but, seats are but I better see it. I see it. And, you know, in the, pa in the past, the standing room was where a lot of the, you know, really serious music lovers and opera lovers would be, you know, to watch, you know, all these singers and performances. Yeah. So how so. did you, how did you transition to, uh, you're not an opera singer? No. Uh, you know, you, you, uh, 
Transition to piano, I guess. Um, um, well, I never, I, I never trans. I started on the piano because you started there. So I, I don't really know anything else, <laughs> but the piano. Um, but the past few years, I have been interested in, you know, opera singing, and I have, I have tried to do it, <laughs> and um, just, you know, for fun, as sort of a little hobby, and I, I do enjoy that but I wouldn't say that I have any kind of you know real voice you know I just do it <laughs> for fun it's, it's okay to just love things you know, you know? Yeah, I yeah, mean yeah. to enjoy them it's uh you don't need to be a pro at everything you know yeah <laughs> so uh, yeah I uh and I think I told you I have this vision of someday singing and playing for Teresa, you know. And, uh, oh yeah, you want you want to sing it and uh, sing it. I accompany. and accompany myself. Oh, while singing, which I've been I've been practicing a little bit lately. That could be an interesting project. I'm no world class singer or world class pianist, but it's fun just to sit in my house and mm. I've been learning German a bit and. Mm. And I mean, you sit and play, accompany yourself playing arias, uh, you know? Sometimes. Yeah, well, I read through a lot of opera scores, just for, partially for fun, and just also I, I like going through it, you know, to, to study some of it. Um, and sometimes I open my mouth and sing <laughs> <laughs> while I'm playing. Um, but yeah, mostly for the, for the music and just to enjoy it while I'm playing see different and I, I do I like to you know a large part of I think playing you know performing any kind of rep like piano repertoire is you also sort of um, have to immerse yourself in all different types of music and a very direct way to do that is just sit down and take out a score that isn't necessarily piano music or something that you're playing and just start you know going through it um, and I think that that does it helps sort of broaden your perspective on you know different things because a lot of operatic composers um, that type of music has a different kind of flow a different kind of phrasing sometimes and sometimes you you see things in that that oh this is how that makes sense you know in the piece that I'm actually playing and you can apply things both ways huh. so you you do sing a bit when you play the piano. Uh, I think yes, you are I have aware. to work on that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> what are you uh, What are you singing generally? Uh, <laughs> when I play, well, as I'm as playing, you're playing, yeah. It didn't I feel like it was like the melody. I uh, mm. maybe sometimes I don't know. It's more. I think it's more of like a. It's more just a vibration. Like I, like in my. I'm not. I don't. I yeah. I don't really sing the melody. It's just sort of a, a little bit of a bad habit. I think that I, sometimes as I'm playing, it helps me like when to br when I breathe, but to feel the vibration so that I re like so it's psychological a little bit. Like I want to feel um, in the fingers like I'm I'm creating a sound that's very round or beautiful or something that. Um, sing you know projects or sings in a way that's not you know striking the key to get a sound you know to shoot out like that so it's like sort of a habit that i've got into it like it's just sort of like a like a vibration in my throat um but i i don't really sing the the, the melodic lines but i would like i would like to diminish that actually that is something I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was like, what, five feet away from you? Like, if I yeah, you can't really. If I was in the audience, out, I don't yeah. know that I would have heard it. Yeah. You know, but I, I think it. I could see it helping you. But just, it does. It helps, like the just the the how you breathe through certain phrases and sure. and make and it releases some of the tension that you know just the physical effort of playing. Sometimes, like I have to you know, make an extra kind of, <laughs> but I, like I said, I, I don't, I hope it's not, you know, too loud where it's heard out there because, but I am trying to sort of diminish that a little bit. So I'll be thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> it was not distracting or anything, mm. you know, to me. Uh, uh, maybe you could, uh, you've gone to, you've studied at some of the best music schools in the yeah. world, like well. <laughs> uh, I would say. Yeah, pretty objectively, I think you could say that. You know? <laughs> so, you, so 
in my reading, you started uh, pretty early. You you'd went to Manhattan uh, School of Music? Yeah, Manhattan Music? School of Music. Pre-college, Pre right? Division. Yeah, for 10 years, I think. 10 years. I studied with Ephraim Briskin um, from the St. Petersburg Conservatory. Oh. And wonderful, wonderful teacher and musician. And then um, after that, I went to Curtis, and I studied with um, Robert McDonald and Ford Lallerstadt who was also my counterpoint teacher and um, I took I he did a very fascinating seminar every week for like a group of a few students and it was a combination of um, like musical analysis um, like his own sort of like um, Schenker but his own sort of you know take on Tilt. it um, counterpoint and then also like a lot of literature reading um, films <laughs> we studied all the and different and philosophical things and different very fascinating very he was very brilliant um, and then after Curtis I went to Juilliard and I was there with Jerome Lowenthal and Stephen Huff which very interesting and I um, but yeah, all these different teachers, I mean, it, it's wonderful because you really sort of, for me, I like to have all these, I like to have all different, you know, types of advice and different kinds of musical backgrounds because it's sort of, you're, you're you know, it gives you a more complete picture, not just how they react to your playing, because that gives you a more clear idea of how people are reacting to certain things and things that you know but it gives you a different way of going about things solving different problems so, like and thinking about your own playing in different ways and each teacher sort of brings a different style or a different um, perspective on the playing and on just piano playing in general and music so for me it's very valuable to have to ha have had those experiences with people who are so different from each other. Do you remember what it felt like when you got accepted to uh, that Manhattan program or Curtis or Juilliard, to, you know? Did you um, open a letter? You know, or? I generally, you know, I generally, I'm, I'm kind of, when it comes to that sort of thing, I'm not very reactive. <laughs> like it, it doesn't, I don't have a very, I don't get a strong emotion from it. But I did, the one that I did remember was when I, when I got into Curtis, I think. Because um, I, I don't think, I wouldn't say surprised <laughs> is, I wouldn't say surprised is the right word. It just, you know, after so many years of hearing about the school and, you know, how few people get accepted actually. And I was not, you know, 100% thrilled with my audition and I just was sort of, I didn't really think about it, like I just went and did it. Um, but when I heard that I got accepted, it sort of for me was, I, I, was, I was particularly happy about that because I felt like it represented, you know, a, a point on my development, you know, as a pianist, a musician, that here I am now and I'm about to go to a new experience with at a new school in a school place like Curtis. And I was really remember being very excited just to, you know, see, you know, being in an environment like that, what it could bring to my mentality when I'm going about practicing and getting better as a pianist and musician. So I do remember that. But beyond that, I don't, <laughs> it, it doesn't really. <laughs> It's well, not a huge thing for me. <laughs> well, how about, I imagine it was, uh, I don't know, interesting, different, something to be with peers that were... Yeah, absolutely. Like, that was part of it. I was just, because I had also gone, I went to, you know, I, I pre-college is a program every Saturday. Um, but then I also went to, norm, like, I went to normal school, like public high school. And, you know, there weren't many musicians there and so you know my, those aspects of my life were very separated so for Curtis it, yeah it was that was a huge part of it was I felt like okay I'm finally going to be fully around people who are doing the same thing as me and doing it at a very high level which is what I've 
sort of always the you know the standard I've always wanted to hold myself to. So that was a big part of it, absolutely. In my uh, in my experience, when you can be when you can personally uh, strive for unapologetic greatness. Well. That's the level <laughs> strive for. You yeah, know. and absolutely. then if you're around people that have that same mentality, then I think that's really where you can. Yeah, 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 a yeah, absolutely, and it definitely does have an effect um, psychologically when you're around people. You know, even when you're around people who are doing the same thing, and even people who are, you know, just that much better than you, <laughs> at, at it, you know, or further along on 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 you know in a certain integration of different you know, aspects of piano playing, it really does help you, you know, to just being in that, you know, environment. It really does change how you, it, it makes you sort of put in that much more effort and sort of really, yeah, sort of in that way. Yeah, I, I think you, uh, for me, I've wanted, uh, when I've been in those situations, I've just wanted to work hard enough so that I could belong, you know, so that I could yeah, feel yeah, yeah. like, oh, I can, I can handle this, and this it's going to take work and it's going to stretch me, but that's what I want to do, you know. And yeah, absolutely. That's oh, an element of it for for sure. Uh, did you? <laughs> it's kind of a dumb question, but did you ever read of the Dumpling Room in uh, New the York Dumpling City? Dumpling Room. It is right next to the Manhattan School of Music. Oh. It is my favorite, like Chinese is food. Is that right in the on world. Broadway? It's right on Broadway. It's I think I, I think I did once. <laughs> I think I usually I go to when I'm around there. I usually go to like pasticci, <laughs> Italian, or like that used to be Bettolona, but it closed. Is it's it closed? There's like that strip that's just north between. Yeah, yeah that's where. Yeah, so that's right where the I usually go is. to the Italian restaurants, but. <laughs> I haven't been there in a while. It was. Uh, I was at Pasticci last week, actually. Oh, really? In New York, yeah, for a birthday party. <laughs> I have never, uh, I've never been. So you still, so now we're here at, yeah, we're in Parkville, yeah, Missouri. Park. How how did you get here? You know. Um, yeah, that was that was very interesting, and it was sort of like a weird chance sort of thing that just happened and um but i did i was a finalist in the american pianist awards in 2021 over the summer and um at the at the last sort of final they had several you know events for the finalists but at the last one um stanislav Ivanich was there because um, his student kenny broberg was in the competition and he won the competition um, and Udenich was there and he saw me play and he came up to me afterwards and he, you know, was very complimentary. And at that point I had just graduated, you know, from Juilliard and um, I was thinking of, I didn't want to go back to, I wanted to take a year off at least from any I, school environments I needed sort of a break from, I think. And I was thinking of just, you know, playing concerts and going to competitions you know, out just myself, you know, I needed to rest from that. And um, so after that meeting, you know, I didn't think anything of, you know, going, I, but I, I, you know, was glad that I had met him and that he enjoyed what I did. But then as the months sort of went on and by October, I'd say of 2021, I sort of began to realize to myself and think, you know, I really do need to have a teacher and to have somebody who can, you know, be list another set of ears to listen to what I'm doing, you know, and give me some suggestions. And there were things at that point that I was still wanting to work on in my playing. And I thought, you know, I need to go to somebody for this. Um, and also just, I thought, you know, also not to be by myself, but I needed to be, you know, around other musicians as well in a, re in a community, you know, I really wanted that. So, by chance, my tuner, my piano tuner in New York, happens to be um, Udenich's tuner. When he when he comes here, he he does the regulation of all these pianos here. So um, I mentioned to him that I was looking for a teacher, and he, you know, said Udenich. I said, oh, I met him. So he sent in the um, an email to him, and then. 
um, immediately he got in touch and said, if you want to come here, I'll, I'll give you a lesson or two, see what's going on. And so I came in November and I played for him. And after that, he said, you're welcome to come here. And I thought it wouldn't be for September of 2022, but actually there was a space open in January. So within a week I was on a plane and I was here. Here you so, are. That's the story <laughs> of how I got here. How does uh, Parkville compare to, you know, Manhattan and uh, Yeah, well, actually, I was, warned, I was warned a lot about that, you know. But I think, I'm, even though I've, I've lived in the city, you know, basically my whole, and four years in Philadelphia, but um, even though I've been in a city my whole life. I think I'm I'm the type of person like it I I was sort of looking to get to a place that's more secluded and someplace where I can really just totally focus on my practicing and what I'm trying to do and and I'd say I do, I I do enjoy, you know, I did enjoy it for a while, you know. I think now um I do now feel like oh sometimes it does get a little bit slow <laughs> you know but sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> so I do sometimes would like to go back you know and forth between the city and here more and I do I do go back and forth um, but you know New York it, it after COVID also it changed a lot and you know even in New York I I I, I never was somebody who went out that much or had I I I enjoy both in that way so you know, I don't have a problem with it being not New York City or some, you know, but it does get slow. <laughs> I mean, I, it's got to help you focus. I mean, I would think, like, you know what you're doing here. And, yeah, uh, it does. And, you know, it, it helps that because in, in, in the city, my piano is right next to my bed. So, <laughs> you know, here I have to walk, you know, from my room to the chapel and I... You know, once I'm here, I'm in a pr real practice room. So it's like it, I, I'm forced to sort of just focus. There's no distractions. So, um, but yeah, that's mostly what it is, is it really this place allows you to totally just be, you know, immersed in what you're doing. And, but the, regularly, you know, where you're regularly every day doing s the same sort of preparation and tasks that builds over time. Uh, can you talk about your uh, the music you played? Um, uh, the let's talk about the let's talk about the fantasy, you know. So mm, we, the uh, Chopin fantasy. Chopin fantasy, Opus Forty Nine. Uh, whatever yeah. you want to talk about for I it, mean, you know? yeah. It's sometimes it's hard for me sometimes to to you know to actually talk about pieces that I play. I find. Um, you know, because sometimes I can, I, I, when I talk about it, it's like sometimes I, when I, I start talking and I start saying something about it, and then I just sort of realize, like, this is really kind of, you know, you know, cliche or vain, <laughs> like something, you know, because I'm trying to describe something that it's like, in a way, it's very sort of mysterious, the way in which a piece communicates and um, but the Chopin fantasy, I find, is sort of one of Chopin's most sort of visually um, descriptive pieces. Um, and it's one that I've sort of, in many sections, like I personally have a very sort of clear, you know, visual of, in a way. Like, almost sort of like a, like a movie, in a sense, but never like the same every time, but in a general sense, because I find the piece sort of, in a way to me um, is very descriptive of, of you know, the, at that time, the war situation that was happening in Poland. Um, and you sort of, you hear all of that, you hear, you see the marches and you, you see, you know, there's parts where I really can see that, you know, the soldiers marching, you know, from a distance and then coming closer, you know, at the way that the music is marked and then how it, you know, in that one section, it's first piano, and then right after it, you know, it goes up an octave, and it's, you know, and it's like, I can see that, you know, in a sense. And then all the different, um, and then it weaves in and out of sort of, I guess, you know, his own personal emotions about it, you know. 
um, and the di the different situate the different you know human sort of dramas and situations that happen in a situation like that. And I feel like the piece is very much. Um, and you even see like the middle section is like a sort of a you know a religious sort of chorus you can hear the people sort of singing and I so that piece really for me is one of his like for me it's one of the most sort of visual visual pieces in terms of how I see it um, so but also for it's also a very difficult piece I think because yeah, there's about... a lot of there are a lot of you know there's a lot of passages in there that I you know I just never seen in any other piece you know because and it's sort of very unique and specific to that and there's and t very difficult um, very there and the opening is so hard you know to control the sound and really you know really listen to what you're doing it's very challenging and all the passage work sort of um, you know, you can hear everything where you can, you, everything has to be so well formed, you know, well taken care of because it's all sort of melodic and you can hear when one note isn't, you know, as, because it's all sort of, it's just a feature of Chopin, I think, um, that makes it so difficult, you know, and then, but the piece also, I think, at the same time as being very challenging, it's also in a way, kind of paradoxically a little bit for me kind of comfortable in once I get past the opening it's kind of comfortable because I feel like you know I can really just let it flow and let it come out and I I don't put any sort of limit on myself because some pieces you need to put a little bit of a limit you need to you know keep a certain discipline of the timing and the but with this piece it just lends itself to my fantasy you know, keyword fantasy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it's different than, for example, the third sonata of Chopin. Now, that's a that's a different. That's there's a lot of similar issues in that piece. But for me, that's one where you really have to be a little bit more um, removed from it in certain places because it's very easy. Like, it there's it's such a it's hard to describe, but I, I think pianists, if they're listening to this, sort of will understand that a little bit, you know. And then, so I also played the Foray Ballad, um, which is a piece, that's a, that was a new piece for me. Um, and that's a fast, there's a pian, that's a fast thing is there's a piano solo version and a version he made for piano and orchestra, which is the one that's performed much more often. Hmm. Um, and Liszt was the one who actually told him to make the orchestral version because um, he took the, the solo version to Liszt and Liszt told him there's too many notes. I can't, there's too many notes. I can't read this, you know, anymore. <laughs> I'm sure he obviously, you know, could do it just fine. But um, that's when Poré made the version with piano and orchestra. And I, I love the version with piano and orchestra, and I think there's sort of a lot, there's different colors that come out, and, um, and it is more, it, it is sort of more, um, it's a little clearer, everything that's going on is a little clearer in the orchestral version, but I love playing the solo version. And I, it's another piece I find very challenging, actually, because you know, there, there are there's so many notes and it goes by you know, in one sweep. Um, and even the opening, the beautiful melody that has many things that, um, you know, even the accompaniment, like the, the, those chords, you know, to phrase it, and shape it really well and not um, have anything sort of sticking out or, you know, or going, you know, too slow or plodding. I think even that's very, very difficult. Um, but the, for, the foray, I, I really love that piece. So I'm gonna keep working on it and doing it hopefully for, you know, this year and hopefully a lot more. Um, and then the Franck, the Franck Prelude Crown and Fugue, which I do want to say, sorry, that for a, the first three minutes, I mean, 
is there more beautiful music out there? Like, yeah, it's, it it's amazing. Just I amazing, love it. You know? I really love it. Uh, um, sings as much as anything I've any Chopin nocturne, any mm. aria. Yeah, and know. I did I did a recital um, last two weeks ago for the U.S. Chopin Foundation in Miami, and that was you know the the program had to had to have half Chopin music and then other pieces sort of inspired by Chopin and the foray was perfect for that because you can really see you know the the connection there and in some ways you know it's even more Chopin than Chopin at yeah. that opening I mean in a different world than Chopin could have written that right like I mean yeah it's not, yeah, yeah. It's not too crazy different than yeah, but it is it is different. This foray has a little bit you can. It has a certain charm, to a certain light, a certain charm and lightness that Chopin also has, um, but Chopin is a little bit more. Um, you know, or I want to say like grounded, but a little bit more classical in a sense of how it how it the phrases work. You know, foray, sort of. It just, you can sort of, you know, play with it a little bit more. And then we have the frog, the, the frog, frog which and is... um, Yeah, that's a, that pe um well, frog, I, I, frog is a very sort of, for me, a very person, I have a very personal connection with frog's music. Um, I don't know why that is. I just, I do, I, for, when I was around 11 or 12, I first heard the quintet, I think. Yeah, it was the quintet. And that was, I, I don't remember, I probably heard the violin sonata before that, but never really, but it was when I heard, I heard the quintet and I just remember like, it, that was a big, like in my sort of mu inner musical life, that was a big sort of moment for me. <laughs> um, I have though, like when I was younger, I had those, I think, even like when I was 12 or 13, I remember um, I, there was, I had a video, my mom bought a video of, um, it was, uh, it was opera, it was Cavalleria Rusticana and Pagliacci, um, the Zeffirelli film of it with, I think the singer, it was Obratsova and Domingo were doing Cavalleria. But I remember I just, I put that on, I was by myself and I walk, and I just, I could not, you know, you know, turn away. I was just, you know, it was for me. And I, cause I had never, even though I had grown up listening to opera, I had ne that was like my first, you know, introduction into that type of opera, you know, and I had never heard music like that. And I was just, and just the expression of it. So for me, that was, so Franck Quintet, you know, that was a big moment. So I was, very obsessed with that piece, and I, I immediately wanted to play it, so I played it. You know, I, <laughs> when I was, you know, thirteen or fourteen, I was, I wanted to play that, and I did it, and then I played it many times after that. And um, but from then, as you know, I got older, I looked at more, and I was always playing the violin sonata, and I had known about the Prelude, Crow, and Fugue for a while, but I just never sort of got around to really learning it. Um, yeah, and then I got into, you know, his orchestral music and, you know, I just, Franck is, I just really feel his music very deeply. Um, but the Chorale and Fugue I first learned in, I started it in 2019 and then I, I played it, you know, I didn't play it for a few months and then I learned it again in a month for a performance at the end of 2020 and then I played it once or twice more in 2021 and then I dropped it for a little bit and then I revived it again last year mm -hmm. um, middle of the year for the long two bow competition um, but yeah th that the piece for me is um, you know one of the greatest sort of musical works I think for the piano and it's um, you know a very <laughs> for me i mean it's a very it's a ver it's very sort of spiritual music i think in a way Absolutely. and and you know sort of in what it 
the, what it sort of describes, you know, about certain internal um, processes, I think. I think it, it really goes very deep into that. I'm not going to start talking about that because you know, I'm a little tired. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, I think it's just a piece that, This is what I can't really discuss this one. I don't really know, you know, exactly how to put it, but it's just a piece that I very strongly feel. And I, it's a, one of my favorite pieces to play in front of people. And I feel like I really, in, when I play it as, you know, I feel like I really, um, you know, it's sort of very fulfilling in a way for me, like to, to express what's in that music. I think I particularly feel it with a piece like that. And I can just sort of play it so many times by, for people and really never get, um, you know, tired of it. So I think that's why I chose it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good sign. Yeah, maybe last thing, maybe you talk about, we were just talking about the theme like oh yeah, emerging, the amazing part at the end, like where they all the themes all happen at the same time, and then kind of that main. Yeah, it's he does he he when it, the way that it's written. I mean, it's not at all written for piano. You know, it's sort of, you know, you you can imagine it working on the organ. You know, because you have the pedals and that opens up. You know, a whole. It basically, open, but you, you, he, he gives it to you, and you sort of have to, you know, find a way to make it work and really be listening very well. And I think in that part, that's where a lot of, you know, my counterpoint training, that really, really helps just to keep all the different sounds in your head, and, um, you know, because you have to, each line has to by itself flow independently, you know, but then somehow you have to, somehow they all line up you know but at, you have to be able to hear both the voices at the same time but also how each line sort of simultaneously is moving and that's what makes it challenging and that's the difference between it sounding like noise and the pianist who sort of knows um, you know it's a it has to sort of and then on top of it all the fast accompaniment notes weaved in and out of that. So it's really, it's, it's a big sort of job, you know, to work on that. But I, that's the one part I'm actually, I'm with the result that I've sort of gotten, I mean, I'm, kind, I'm happy about that actually, that I was able to sort of think of, I like what I do there, in other words. <laughs> um. I like it, <laughs> I, I told you I, that line was, you know, just, could totally hear it. And, yeah, and I like. Yeah, so but the that's one of chaos, the, that's you know? that's an amazing moment I think in music just in general. You know? agree, yeah. And just the level of of compositional skill, you know, to be able to pull something like that off. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's kind of the yeah the culmination of fifteen minutes of great yeah. music, you know, yeah. and all and the coming whole, together. The whole and piece is just and it. That's something about Frank that I, because I, one thing I love about Frank particularly is that there's nothing in his music is sort of wasted or sort of um, like, so, like you hear something very beautiful, but then it never comes back and you sort of have that one. But in Frank, like everything is used again and it, and it, um, all, it all is sort of very, it's sculpted in a way, like in a very clear, sort of in a clear way it sort of all is structured like that and it's very it's it's a different kind of ex music to experience because it's not it's not just the music it's sort of also um, you know it's like a meta element of sort of a philosophical statement or a, you know something and that's the effect that bringing using all these themes and then bringing them together sort of has on the listener yeah what do you uh what do you have coming up what are you excited about in music for the next couple years you know I mean, uh... um well i'm gonna be going to some competitions hopefully starting at the end of this year and then the next few years i'll be doing them um 
but right now I'm looking for, I'm going to um, in festival in Santander, Spain in July. It's called Encounters. So oh. I'm excited about that. You've done it just bringing me. <laughs> so I'm excited about that. Um, and just some, I have some recitals, you know, and things. And then I'll, I'll be sending in my audition tapes for competition. For, I think I'll have one in November, hopefully. Well, I wish you the best. Uh, thanks Thank a lot you. for chatting at, Thank uh, you. and playing. Nice That's to talk to you. I, and I enjoyed it very much. So thank you. Hey, thanks a lot.